All right, we're going to see how we go here to finish up the book. Uh, we've had a long journey. We have gotten messages from or from Jesus to the churches. We said the seven is probably uh, symbolic. All the numbers in Revelation are really symbolic numbers, not meant to be taken literally. Um, so there's a message not only for the people in John's day, but there's a message for all the church at all time. Some interesting things in those words of Jesus that we need to keep in mind as we went through the book. We talked about recapitulation, how John recapped things with the bolt, with the seals, the trumpets, the bowls. And then there was times in between where he talked specifically, like 17 and 18, where he talked about Babylon and destruction. Babylon is symbolic in John's day for who? No. And any earthly power, really, the beast coming out of the sea, the beast coming out of the earth, the beast out of the sea, symbolic of of antichrist uh, rule, governing rule, uh, the beast from the earth, antichrist religion, that uh, continually trying to pull people away from God. And they do that with the seduction process. They, it compared Babylon to a harlot, right? Uh, and, and Israel was told by the prophets that they too played the harlot. Uh, spiritual adultery is the key. That's the symbolism there. And that's, that's all through a lot of the, the messages here in the book. So then when we come toward the end there, we dealt with 19, this battle that was recapped again, we believe, in chapter 20. Uh, we've got the thousand years, and that's where things get a little crazy. And people want to say the thousand years is literal, even though all the other numbers in Revelation were symbolic. <laughs> it's hard to say that one suddenly becomes literal, but they do now again. It's not something that we should be fussing at each other about or dividing about. It's just trying to connect Scripture with Scripture. And if that's the case, then the thousand years, the three and a half times, uh, the time, time and a half, all of those are symbolic of the time between the beginning of the church and Christ's second coming. And then we kind of recapped and talked about Satan's being bound which Jesus said in the Gospels that you have to bind the strong man, same word. And we talked about him being imprisoned and then released, not for a final battle, but for judgment and execution. Well, that's kind of things in a nutshell. And then I don't think I put up this passage uh, in Isaiah 24. You might want to just run back there real quick. I want you to see, again, the connection that John is using with the Old Testament. That, to me, is very key. Um, however you want to look at things, John used over 500 different references or allusions to the Old Testament. And as we just covered chapter 20 in, in Isaiah 24, notice the similarities. And when you go back and reread some of these passages that, that I've mentioned here, uh, see the connection. But look at Isaiah 24, 21. It says, In that day the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above, What's he talking about? These rebellious spiritual beings who have concocted all these crazy religions, which he dealt with those same beings in Egypt with the plagues, and the kings on the earth below. This is looking toward the final culmination of everything in Isaiah's day. And they will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. That sounds similar, doesn't it? They will be shut up in prison, punished after many days. The moon will be abashed, the sun ashamed. Same kind of imagery. The Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion in Jerusalem before its elders gloriously. And then if you slip over to chapter 27, the same imagery is found in the first verse. The Lord will punish with His sword, His fierce, great, and powerful sword, Leviathan the gliding serpent, Leviathan the coiling serpent. He will slay the monster. Leviathan is symbolic for the evil, the chaos that comes about in the world. That's almost always the symbolic reference that is used for Leviathan. So that, those passages like that tie back into John's message in Revelation 20. So now, we're going to come to 21 and 22, and praise God for the victory. Wow, we're going to see some neat stuff here, and in light of all the stuff we said that's going crazy in our world, let's get some hope, okay? Let's get some joy here. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there's no longer any sea. What does sea stand for? Evil or chaos, okay, that needs to be calmed. 
I saw the holy city. What's the holy city? And the new Jerusalem. What's that symbolic of? The church, right? Yes, that's right, the church. And you see those terms in Revelation? That's what it's symbolically talking about. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a what? A bride. Did we talk about that earlier? We did. We saw the connection between what a Jewish wedding and all the parts of that and how that connects to Christ being the, the bridegroom for the church. Ephesians 5 talks graphically about that picture. As a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now, now, what's he seeing? He's seeing this in his vision. Is what? The dwelling of God is with men and He will live with them and they will be His people and God Himself will be with them and be their God. And what does that take us back to? Eden in Genesis. Wasn't that what happened there? Wasn't God walking in fellowship with, him, with them in the garden? Yeah. Who else was there? Well, spiritual beings were there. We know that because Eve communicated with the devil in the garden, right? He tempted her. He had to be there to do that. If you tie Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28 into that, we see that that's, a, that's probably a picture of, of the devil there uh, that goes back to that very scene. But think of that. Think of the joy that now is going to come in this vision. We've got, we've got God dwelling with us, there with us. We get to be with Him. We get, we get a renewed heaven and earth. Okay? We're not going to be sitting on some cloud somewhere, you know, and, ephemeral spirit. We're, not, we're going to have substance and all of that's going to be renewed. And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Wow. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Now, go flip back just a bit to Second Peter chapter 3 and look at what Peter ties in with what John just said. 2 Peter 3, verse 7, By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Alright, then he goes into the thousand year thing, like a day is worth a thousand years and so forth. And then verse 10 says, The day of the Lord is going to come like thief. And the heavens will disappear, and the elements will be destroyed, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Now, He's not going to wipe out the earth. He's going to renew it and cleanse it by fire, it says here. And then the, the culminating verse there in verse 11 of 2 Peter 3 is since that's going to happen, everything's going to be destroyed. Here's the key. What kind of people are you going to be? What kind of life are you going to live? If that's the case. And He says it is. So you ought to live holy and godly life as you look to the forward to the day of God and speed its coming. And then those, those have the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt. We're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of right. Peter corresponds, ties right in with John's words here in Revelation 21. Okay? He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. He's not making new things. He's making everything new. Now, the Greeks had two different words for new. Uh, one was neos, which means something new uh, that's never been. Like, oh, you have a new baby. <laughs> well, that baby never existed. It's now a new baby and completely new in the beginning. But the other word for new in the Greek language is kainos, which means new in quality. So it's like restoring an old car or an old home. Uh, people do that a lot, don't they? They'll buy homes and then they'll renovate them and restore them or they'll get a car and renovate the car. That's the picture. He's going to renovate, He's going to renew, redeem this earth, cleanse it by fire, and it's going to be renewed just like even better than the, new, than the old Eden where Adam and Eve lived. So that's, that's the picture here. So as we get to the chapter, just read 2 Peter 3. See, we know it's a symbol of evil. evil. Creation, Romans 8, Paul had said that all of creation has been waiting for this day that John saw in his vision. Everybody, everything's been waiting for that. Because all of creation was affected by the curse, right? By sin. Everything was. Everything was distorted. New is the kainos, new in quality. Heaven and earth are now together again. Notice it said new heavens and earth. 
So that what do you remember what we said the temples uh, the temple was supposed to be what it was supposed to be or picture. What what did a priest do? What's the definition of a priest? An interceder, a mediator, bringing God to men, men to God. The temple is that centerpiece bringing heaven down to man, man to heaven. And the priests are serving in that work. That's the whole idea of the tabernacle and the temple was to bring the two together with God's glory dwelling where? Right in the Holy of Holies on the, on the, ark, on the mercy seat of the ark, right? So that's the picture here. Heaven and earth are going to be joined again. We're going to be one with God. We're going to be in fellowship with Him, literally, as Adam and Eve were. Walking with Him, fellowshipping with one another and with Him. That, that's pretty good news. <laughs> that's pretty good news, isn't it? So the church, as we said, is the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and the bride that's ready for Christ to present to the Father. All right? So how are they new? Just to summarize some things here, all, all that has fallen, as we're reading here in this chapter, is gone. All that has fallen. The curse is gone. What did he say? No tears, no sorrow, no pain. Hallelujah. Amen? Yeah. Aren't we had enough pain? Heaven and earth are together. The curse has now been <coughs> reversed. Okay? Well, that's, so all things are going to be cleansed and made new. He said to me, it's done. Verse 6, I am the Alpha and the Omega. We've heard that before, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Wow. Where do you go back to to think about the water of life? What comes to mind? A woman at the well. A woman at the well. And Jesus met her there and said, Oh, if you knew who you were talking to, <laughs> you would ask and he would give you the water that's living water. She kept thinking about physical water and filling her jug up, of course, but he's telling her something more. And then he said, which is nowhere else in the Gospels, I am he. I am the one. I am the Messiah. And think about this water of life picture. And the water of life picture is throughout several places in Scripture. But also think about the overcomers. Well, I summarize for you on that one handout each church's promise to those who overcome. And many of these are repeated here in this last chapter uh, or two. And one is the right to eat. Ephesus has promised the right to eat from the tree of life. There it was back in Genesis, right? Now we get, we're going to get to see that again. And they will inherit all this. But, verse 8, and you can kind of look at that as we get to the overcomer promises again. In verse 8, we've got a list here. Uh, by the way, verse 3, I kind of skipped that a minute. Uh, now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them, and they will be His... Most of your translations have a singular people there, right? Actually, the text in the Greek is plural. It should read peoples. What is that telling us? It's telling us that now the, the, the scattering of the nations that happened at the Tower of Babel, back in Genesis 11, remember that? And they were put under the rule of these other spiritual beings who kind of corrupted things. All right? Now he's saying, those are coming back to me. And that's been the work of the church ever since Pentecost. They're being reclaimed. They're coming back. They're coming to Christ all over the world. They're coming even though there's banning of missionary. They're still coming. Okay? They're coming out of those places of tribulation and oppression. And that's the picture there in verse 3 is now those people groups, all those peoples, are going to be welcomed into the family of God. Faithful believers will get this promise of drinking of the water of life. He's the one who has it. And then this list of eight. And the first one is cowardly. Where did that come from? The other stuff we can understand. Yeah, that's that's a picture of unbelievers. Uh, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, Marzikards, idolaters, liars. We 
We can understand that, but what about cowardly? It's kind of an interesting term to head the list. It's a military term. And it means to be ashamed or afraid of, the, of giving your testimony in a spiritual sense. Um, remember the words of Jesus to the churches? To stand firm, to reject the false teaching, to be an overcomer. Some cases, in many cases, five out of seven, he talked about repenting and returning. This is maybe likely a reference to those who have caved in. They've abandoned, they, they don't want to fight. They, they've responded like uh, a person in the military when they will. That kind of picture is there. That's very likely what that's referring to. Um, those who were simply not able or afraid to, to stand their ground and, and remain faithful. Uh, so John sees the church coming down. And one of the seven angels, this is verse 9, who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. There's the picture again. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city. He's showing him the church, the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. It's shown with the glory of God. Its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. Where have we seen the picture of jewels before? Well, they adorned, in many cases, the tabernacle, later the temple, but they also adorned the high priest's garment, uh, where many of the jewels are, are pictured for us. Um, the picture of brilliance, of brightness, uh, all of that is there. It had a great high wall of 12 gates. Now, I gave you a handout, too that had on it the symbolism of the 12 that is mentioned throughout the rest of this chapter and what those probably signify. Perfect or completeness. A great high wall, perfect or complete inclusion. Okay, uh, There's a separation between those who are outside and those who are inside. Okay, That's the picture there. The gates. Okay, again, security picture. It's the symbolism that's important here, not the number. All right, foundations, security again. It can't be shaken. Remember the message to Philadelphia that had all the earthquakes and the people would flee out of the city and run out because they were afraid anytime one started. And, and, he, and, and the promise there was, I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Security. Uh, the measuring means ownership. Okay, and so the measuring takes us back again. Ezekiel measured the temple in his day. The temple wasn't there. And earlier when we read about John measuring, the temple wasn't there then either. It's 80, 70, it was destroyed. Well, back in Daniel's day, it was destroyed then too. Uh, Babylon destroyed it once, Rome destroyed it again. So it's, it's not about a physical temple, it's about what it represents. Uh, Perfect guidance and reality. No, don't need the sun or moon anymore. Those were light containers needed for a time, but don't need that anymore because He is light. <laughs> right? So we're in His presence, His brilliance. Uh, redeemed. All of creation is redeemed. And nothing unclean is going to be included there. So that is the picture of the twelve that's mentioned here on the gates, the name of the twelve tribes, uh, you've got the apostles, the twelve apostles. All of that is symbolic imagery. And the angel who talked with me in verse 15 had a measuring rod. There's the measuring coming in again. It's not about a physical place. It's about showing it. It's a big place. <laughs> there's plenty. And what's the old gate that's on? There's plenty of room in the family. Plenty of room here for God's people to dwell. All right. Foundation were decorated. It's got the precious stone picture again. And it lists all those precious tones that have been listed elsewhere in Scripture. And verse 22 says, I didn't see a temple. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are at the temple. Uh, that was needed here on earth for a while because we needed to bring heaven to earth and earth to heaven. And that was the center point. Don't need that. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine. The glory of God is, is, is the light. And the Lamb, the lamb, uh, the, the lamb is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring splendor to it. And on no day will the gates be shut. Well, you got gates, but they can be open. Why? Because perfect security. You don't need an alarm system. Why? Well, because evil's gone. 
The sea is calm. The enemy is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Nothing impure will enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. Only the names that are written in the Lamb's book of life. Wow. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a picture. What a glorious picture. We have the victory. Wow. And we see all this stuff going on around us. It, it breaks our heart to see the crime, the shootings, innocent children being shot down, policemen being shot down for no reason. Just, just gunned down. It's going on all over the place in our big cities, all over this country. And we're scratching our heads saying, how can this happen? How can this happen in a country that has been so free for so long, and yet now we're under attack? We're under attack. Physically and spiritually, we are under attack. Um, we, we have to listen to those messages to the churches. We have to listen. Jesus said, if you have ears to hear, let them hear. Listen to the Word. Listen to what's coming, because it is coming. And in this last verse, this, this is a picture of reconciliation. Oh, isn't it going to be great? The, the, the relationships are going to be totally restored. Because the curse just blew that apart. Family squabbles and differences. Husbands and wives that have divided and split. Children that have broken from their parents. All of that's going to be restored. Harmony. Unity. Those relationships between man and man are going to be healed. And between God and man, there's so many people who are angry at God. They're just angry at God. It must be His fault. That's going to be restored and healed. Between man and creation, it's going to be healed. <laughs> We don't need to worry about these tragedies we're talking about. Because they won't be there. All of creation, God, Paul said in Romans 8, is waiting for this healing, redemptive day. The tree of life, of course, takes us back to Eden. And we get to feast on the tree of life. So the angel showed me again. Look at, verse, look, look at chapter 22. What has he shown again? The, tree, the river of the water of life. We just read about that in 21, didn't we? There it is again. It keeps coming back. As clear as crystal. Yes, it's pure. Clear. Flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. All this is great picture imagery. And on each side of the river, look, look what's there, the tree of life. Oh, on each side of the river. What's it doing? Bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Boy, boy that, that's pretty good return, isn't it? Every month. <laughs> Usually on trees, you got to wait how long for a crop to come out of it? At least every year, don't you? To get the fruit and all that. Well, this is every month. What's that a picture of? This is the prosperity. The, the, the healing, the health that is there. It's all, nothing's going to stop it. Yielding fruit. And the leaves of the tree are for healing of the nations. There again, the picture of God bringing in and reclaiming all those nations that were scattered at the time of Babel. They're coming back in. They're going to be around the throne. No curse anymore. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will serve Him. That word serve is latuero in the Greek, which means this is a priestly service. Well, guess what Jesus called us? A kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. That's what He called Israel back at Mount Sinai. They didn't quite live up to it as a nation, but now we are the priests our holy God. We are in priestly service for Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. There's that picture of that imagery of who you belong to. The character of your life is reflected as you reflect Jesus. Wow. No more night. No need of light of the lamp or the light of the sun. I don't think anybody enjoys just being in the dark, here we? We don't like walking in the dark. We like to find a light somewhere, <laughs> be it a light switch or a flashlight or a match or something because we need something to light the way so we can see to get around. Well, they, they, they will be, there will be no more night and there will not need to be a light of a lamp or a light of the sun because, again, the Lord God is the light and they will reign 
forever and ever. And that's one of the promises listed on your sheet there from the overcomers, that you get to rule with Him and reign with Him in His glory. Wow. Literally, God is going to go back to John chapter 1, where it says the Word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacle or dwelt among us. Well, that's, that's the same sense here out of this chapter, was that God is now, He's pitched His tent back in the middle of His people. And now He's going to walk in fellowship with us throughout eternity. And again, a lot of those pictures are also in the, in the prophets in the Old Testament, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, all of that. The church has been adorned, made ready for this meeting. Uh, the word adorned in the Greek, it, it's where we get our word cosmetics. Um, all gussy up. <laughs> all dressed up. Looking fine and dandy. I mean, when a bride gets ready, what, what does it take her, usually? <laughs> At least all day, if not more than that. Because I remember, they've got to go to the hairdresser and the nail salon and the and then there's all the other things you got to buy all the accoutrements. And, I don't know. It's, it's a lot of process, right? Yeah. A lot, a lot of work to be done for that. Well, that's the picture here. How long, how long are we in preparation? Our life. We're in preparation. We're adorning ourselves now for that meeting. We're laying aside uh, those things that, that are going to be treasured up in heaven. And, and we're going to be clothed in a brand new glorified body. Hallelujah. And we're going to get to be with this is This is good news. We need some good news, right? Man, so much bad news out there. We need some good news. So God is speaking directly here. And faithful believers, again, picturing back in John 4, this water of life imagery. That Jesus said that a lot. In fact, in John 7, I believe it is, when he was teaching on the temple steps, he clearly said, I am the water of life. I am that. Okay? So, verse 7. Behold, I am coming when? Should we be anticipating His arrival any day? Yep, we should be. That parable of the bridegroom, you know, getting the lamps ready and waiting. Blessed is He. There's another uh, of the Beatitudes in Revelation. <clears throat> Blessed is He who what? Keeps the words of the prophecy in His book. The same thing John said in chapter 1, or Jesus said in chapter 1, <clears throat> is the same thing here at the end. Blessed, happy, is the one who is willing to listen and obey and keep my words. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I, what in the world, John? What's going on with you? <laughs> he fell down and to worship at the feet of the angel. Didn't he try that before? <laughs> it didn't work then. It's not working here now. John, not now. Not the angel. Are there still people who want to try to do things like that? Worship angels. They were doing it in Paul's day. He had to write to the city in Colossae about that. He said, don't get involved in that stuff. And John, you know, come on. I can see him being overwhelmed, though. If you had a vision like that, you would be too. And maybe it's just the fact that he's so overcome and overwhelmed that that's, that's his response. And if so, that's fine. But the, notice the angel says, don't do that. I'm just a fellow servant. The angels are ministering servants with you and your brothers and the prophets of all who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Just worship God. Get your focus on Him. Let Him be the center. And then he says, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. Well, that's the exact opposite of what God told Daniel. Because if you go back to Daniel chapter 12, He told Daniel to kind of seal that up for now because Daniel's book was primarily talking about the first coming of Jesus. And now we're looking at the second coming of Jesus. And so in Daniel's day, it was like, okay, we're... We're keeping that closed up for now. Not going to be open or revealed yet. And now we've what? Well, we've had the scroll, the, the seals open. We've had the trumpets blown. We've had the bowl poured out. Everything is culminating here now. Don't seal up the words. Time is near. Let him who do, now. What is verse eleven about? Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong, and let him who is vile continue to be vile. And let him who does right continue to do right, and him who is holy continue to be holy.
thoughts. Basically, St. God is saying, look, remember earlier, the ones who belong to him are marked. What's the mark mean? Your life, your character, who you belong to, who you worship. Basically, this is saying, look, if this is the course that you want your life to go, remember Romans chapter 1 where Paul said, if you're determined to worship the creature and not the creator, what will God do? If you want... Huh? Yeah, he will basically turn you over to that, let you have your way. He will say, okay, if that's your if that's your intent, if that's where your heart is, if your heart is focused as being an earth dweller, and all your life is focused on the earth dwelling, okay. And and that's what Paul said in Romans 1. God will give them over to a depraved mind and let them go ahead and experience those things. And that's the sense of this verse. Those who are walking with Him, He's saying what? Keep walking with Me. Keep doing the right thing. Let that mark be revealed in your character, in how you speak, in how you relate to people, in how you deal with life. Let that mark shine. That's what He's saying here. Uh, think back to Noah's day. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. How long did we think that he preached for, possibly, in the building of the ark? Maybe as long as, what, 120 years if you look at the text? Well, if that's the case, what was Noah trying to do? Convince them to listen, right? God is bringing on a day of judgment. Listen to Him. And they would probably mock Him, laughed at Him. So the only ones who got in the ark were who? Just His, just his family. The eight souls. And then Noah didn't shut the ark door, did He? No, God did. That's the same picture. God was saying, look, I've given you all these opportunity, all this opportunity to repent. You didn't want to. You wanted to stay an earth dweller, and the door of the ark got shut, and judgment came. And Noah and his family were saved through the water. Interesting. And the others were destroyed through the water. They had an opportunity, but they didn't take it. Behold, I'm coming soon. Verse 12, there it is again. That was also said in verse 7. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. There's a picture of reward again. Will believers have some reward of some kind? It, it appears so, doesn't it? My reward is with me, and I'm going to give out to those as he deems, however that's going to be. Okay? I am the Alpha and the Omega. There that is again. First and last, beginning and end. He's the source, the center of everything. Whether it has a beginning or an end, He's it. And there's another beatitude in verse 14. Blessed are those who what? What's that a picture of? Washing the robe. What's that? When was your robe washed? When you, were, when you were made one with Christ. When you accepted by faith the message and you were baptized into Him. You were cleansed from within. Your soul was cleansed. Forgiven. Healed. Okay? That's the first picture of a resurrection that's to come which will be the bodily one later but blessed are those who wash their robes white linen or the washing of robes has to do with our life, our character it needs to be it needs to be that we have been reborn in Christ, reborn from above then they then get the right to the tree of life, that's in one of the promises to the churches that we just read listed there, that they may have the right to the tree of life, go through the gates of the city Outside, though, notice the distinction. There are those who are inside, surrounded by the imagery picture of the walls and the gates, okay? But outside are what? Outside are the dogs. Graphic picture here. Those who practice magic arts, sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. In other words, everyone who continues to follow the beast. If that's their intent, if that's the, their life's goal, is to walk the way of the world and follow the beast, then that's the result. That's what Scripture says. Now, we don't want that for anybody, do we? We don't want that, so we want to communicate the gospel whenever we get the opportunity so that they will know the truth and they will have an opportunity to respond to the truth. But these are those who have refused it. And they're just set on their own destiny. Um, 
As somebody said once, really God doesn't send anybody to hell. <laughs> the person sends themselves there, right? I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. Okay, we know this has to be a message not just for those in John's day, but for the church all over time. I am the root and the offspring of David. There it goes back to the Old Testament. Isaiah 11.1 1 talks about the root or the branch from Jesse. David's father is the Messiah. All right. And the bright morning star. He is the true bright morning star. All right. Not the devil. The spirit and the bride are saying what? Come. What did he say to the church in Laodicea? I stand at the door and, and knock. To anyone who opens, oh, I want to come in and sit down and have fellowship with you. It's to believers. Keep that door open. Keep that door open because you want more than anything else to be in His presence. You want Him to overshadow your life. And the invitation continues. Come. Let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take that free gift of the water of life. There it is again. We read it back in verse 1. We read it back in chapter 21. Drink freely from the water. I don't know how much more we can say that. We need to be immersed in Christ. Not in religion. In Christ. Not in form. In Christ. Not in material stuff. In Christ. We need to drink fully from Him. How do you do that? Can you do that in an hour on Sunday morning? No, we, you all know that. You can't. You have to drink from Him and gain from Him every day. Just like you need to put substance in your body every day. You need to spiritually feed the soul. And if I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in the book. If anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things say, yes, I am coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus. There it is again. It's all through this chapter. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with his people. Amen. Wow.